Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we have a great topic that we're going to talk about. It is a Microsoft doc that is on our learn page and it's called protecting M365 from on-premise attacks. We've talked about many of the things within this document and I've even referenced this document on a previous show saying, Hey, we should do a whole show on this. And so that's what we're doing tonight. Love it. The, f- the first thing that I wanted to say right off the bat is number one, right in the documentation in the first few sentences it says that microsoft recommends that you implement this guidance the second thing i will say is that i don't know of many companies out there that have fully implemented this guidance in fact when we start talking about the very first one you're probably going to be like oh that's something i need to probably do so you know security is a journey and you may not be there yet, but this is a roadmap for you. So from a high level, we're going to kind of talk about the things that this documentation recommends and then some specific security recommendations in each one. So when we talk about threats to on-premise environments, there are two major vectors of attack. The first one is federated trust relationships. And that's like SAML authentication when you're using on-prem AD to authenticate to M365, commonly known as ADFS. And this is a concern if your SAML token signing certificate is compromised, because if that happens, then Federation allows anyone who has that certificate to impersonate any user in the cloud. So we've talked about ADFS and trying to get rid of ADFS and in this documentation says, you know, you should disable federated federation trust relationships when possible and migrate to something called account synchronization, which is syncing accounts between on-prem using AD connect to Azure AD. But that can still be a vector of attack. In fact, that's the second one because any, modified privileged users, including their credentials or groups, have administrative privileges in M365 can be used to attack the cloud. So Microsoft recommends that you synchronize only objects that have no privileges beyond a user within M365. Anything that has privilege or trusted role within Azure should be kept within Azure. And any privileged users on AD should be kept within AD. So basically keeping those separate, which is like the first thing in the guidance. So when we talk about the guidance, we're going to talk about four things. The very first thing is isolating M365 admin accounts. We've mentioned this before. Alex Weinhardt has a post about it. This means that you need to master your admin accounts within Azure AD, and those accounts are just cloud accounts. There's no user that is provisioned on-premise in Active Directory that syncs to Azure AD with an admin role. And then, of course, those users need to be authenticated using multi-factor, secured by Azure AD conditional access, and accessed only using Azure managed workstations. Now this one can be a tough one because at least at Microsoft, I'm pretty sure that we have on-prem admins separate from our Azure AD admins because we're a big enough company that we probably have on-premise folks as well as Azure AD. But many people at companies, those are the same people. So you start having to manage multiple credentials If you're using pause, you have to manage multiple workstations. So there are creative ways to do this, but the recommendation is to use an Azure managed workstation that is locked down using conditional access for those admin accounts. 
There's some security recommendations specifically for this as well. You want to implement privileged identity management and used privileged access to devices, as well as use the least privileged role necessary to do the required tasks. So I know when I've done this in the past, I've scaled back all the roles for all the admins and then kind of waited for them to say, hey, Andy, I used to be able to do this thing and I have to do it all the time, but I don't have the permission anymore. So then you gradually give them more permission so that they have all the things that they need for their daily job. And then it's like, oh, I need to do this thing. Well, how often do you need to do it? Oh, once a week. Okay, well, that's something that privileged identity management can then take care of because you only need to elevate to that role when you need it. So that was a lot right there. I'm going to take a pause because that is probably one of the toughest things already to do is to separate your admin accounts from the cloud and on-prem. Yeah, we did touch on a lot right up front in this show, but there's just a lot here to unpack. First off, as we always mention, Andy and I both work for Microsoft. Uh, so this is guidance we've been exposed to. And I'd say we both definitely agree with that's why we're doing a show about it. Um, what a couple things I find interesting. Number one, Microsoft doesn't often say like, we strongly recommend you do exactly this. You know, Microsoft's definitely a company of choice. There's many different ways to do this thing. There are many beautiful options for you in the world. And so when Microsoft comes very prescriptively and says, you should do this thing, and it's it's not necessarily to for any purpose other than helping secure your organization, I think you should sit up and take notice. And so while some of this guidance is like for this first thing was to fully isolate your administrative accounts, note that Andy did not qualify it to just administrative accounts for the guidance that you really should move away from federated authentication entirely. Um, but if you can't, at the very least, you know, some of these will help mitigate that risk. But that's an even bigger step as well as to move to some of those managed authentication options like password hash synchronization or password authentication. I don't want to get off on that tangent. But just to note that the the guidance here actually speaks broader than your admins and says really, unless you have like a regulatory requirement or a technical requirement, you shouldn't use federated auth at all. That said, moving on to this specifically isolating administrative accounts, I, I, I think I first became aware of this guidance in the aftermath of the solar winds and solarium compromises. And, and that's when this really came to light. I think for a lot of folks, because they use that initial compromise to steal those certificates and be able to basically mint their own SAML tokens that said, I'm the global admin. Let me go do whatever I want. And be aware, this risk is not alone to like the Microsoft 365 environment. If you, for example, used ADFS to give access to salesforce.com or box or any other third-party SaaS application, this risk could be there too, to where again, I could gain access on premises and then go mint my own tokens that say I'm the global admin in salesforce.com inbox or wherever. This risk is the same. Obviously, we're just focused on our own world, which is the Microsoft world. And so this is how you protect that. But that's why that risk actually is, is broader than that as well. Uh, I love the call it on privileged identity management. And I make this point frequently that the privileged identity management function in Azure Active Directory enables you just by its normal behavior to also get to a place of um, least privileged roles, like just enough access GIA kind of model, because you can, as you go in the interface, essentially choose which roles and you can be eligible for multiple roles that you want to elevate into. So if you need to do a task that requires you to maybe wear multiple hats, I need to control change conditional access policies and make some changes to an Intune, say, compliance policy. I still don't need global admin for that. I could be Intune admin and literally conditional access administrator. And I could put both of those hats on and go do the thing I need to do. So PIM, I think, really does help 
carve out just the amount of access you need to do the thing. And sometimes you may need to put on multiple hats and elevate into multiple roles. And sometimes you can just do the one role for the task at hand. So I think that works out really well. And then just one final note, when we've brought this up to customers in the past, and again, Andy, you've already said this, we, we don't see a lot of customers who are fully baked in this model today. If you are, congratulations. If you're not, you've got company. Um, the pushback we get are things like, well, you know, we don't want to have to go disable like multiple accounts when somebody gets terminated in a, an administrative role, or we just don't want that, that volume to manage. And I get that. You know, a lot of the the promise of moving to a single sign-on model is you have that single account to disable, and it automatically goes and disables across every, say, SaaS application that users provision to. And so I get that this is, in some ways, a step backwards. But weighing that risk, which can be solved really through process, against this risk, which again, nobody has solved because if we'd solved cyber risk, then we wouldn't have a show to talk about. <laughs> there, There is that risk of on-premises compromise and let's at least close the blast doors and prevent it from becoming laterally moved into the cloud as well and a privileged role there. So I, I get the pushback, but I think if you sit down and really think about this or even put pen to paper, you'll recognize that one risk can be pretty pretty well mitigated the other risk is unknown and not easily mitigated and even if it's less likely to happen that if it does happen the impact is much greater right so as you do that full analysis on probability versus impact and everything else you may weigh in your evaluation i think this still comes out on top and that's why the guidance is to do it there are compromises for sure like for example the second one here i'll talk about real quick which is manage devices from m365 and if you've listened to the show you know that we're a huge fan of intune as well as doing azure ad join using conditional access and that's what this is so you're protecting your on-premise environments by moving those workstations to the cloud using cloud-based mobile device management and eliminating your dependencies on on on-premise device management infrastructure because that can be compromised, right? And so if you have a device that's compromised that has access to on-prem, you know, and Office 365 or M365 admin, that's a way to get in. And so, you know, if I'm thinking about compromises, number of devices that you have to manage, number of credentials you have to manage, it can get tough, but let's say you do sync and keep syncing your admin accounts from on-premise AD. You can still apply conditional access to a device, make sure that device is managed, and make sure that device is you know low risk, the sign-in risk is low, and still provide that before you access the administrative portals. So that is a compromise because now you're mixing in some more protection. It's not the recommendation, obviously, here, but I certainly do understand the difficulty. Like Adam said, you have to disable then multiple admin accounts, and it's not a, I just turn off your AD account, and all of a sudden you have no more admin access, right? Cloud access is difficult, and that's like something you deliberately have to go and turn off because they will have access outside of your corporate network to the administrative realm unless you implement conditional access with devices because then you can just deprovision that device. It talks to the internet. It's deprovisioned. Now they don't have access, right? So that is the best way mixing in the device management, conditional access for devices as well as you know the separation from the cloud. So there, there can be some compromises here, but as we go down, this is the recommendation and these are the best practices. The third one is ensuring that no on-premise account has elevated privileges to M365. So the first part is just admin accounts. I would consider that like global admins, domain admins, like don't sync domain admin accounts to M365. 
don't have accounts that are synced and grant those global admin access. This is now any accounts that are synced between on-prem and a and Azure AD. We mentioned in the beginning, the only accounts that are recommended to sync are ones that are just users. And so this means help desk, you know, admin or exchange admin, which is very powerful or SharePoint admin, which is another powerful role. Like those should be cloud accounts only and mastered in Azure Active Directory rather than a synced account. So that also includes groups. So make sure that these accounts aren't included in groups that also are granted privileged roles in Azure AD. And finally, um, you know, making sure that service accounts. Service accounts are, I think, notorious for being over-permissioned, making sure that those are not included in privileged cloud roles. Right? You can have service principles in privileged roles, and it's a single application, single privileged um, service principle, but that should not be a synced user account from AD on-prem to Azure into a privileged role. So, um, yeah, that's the third thing. Any thoughts on that, Adam? Yeah, uh, I, I think I kind of already got into those waters. I talked about that a little bit, responding to the first thing, but I, I see this as kind of an extension of that, and, and you alluded to that as well. The first one is specific about those administrative roles that you think of, but there may be other privileged roles that might you might not think in your mind as, well, that's an administrative role, but still, the line of the sand is really clear here. No synchronized identity should have any elevated privileges, period. Any identity with elevated privileges should be a cloud-only identity, should be mastered in the cloud, essentially. And, and then kind of going back to the other point, too, you talked about with the second thing, and that was the managed devices in Microsoft 365. And it was talking about essentially doing cloud management with Intune and doing a cloud identity uh, for the device identity, Azure AD Join. I think that's less of a security control and more of a high availability control or, or surviving a compromise. So I, I would see it as a concern of, let's say your on-premises infrastructure gets just absolutely, I mean, it's Maersk, right? Which we, Gavin Ashton, friend of the show, has been on several times. We've heard how dire that was. But, but again, just because you, you basically lose your on-premises infrastructure, that shouldn't mean you lose the ability to manage your cloud infrastructure. And so having administrative devices that are a cloud-only identity or a cloud device identity, that is helpful in the sense that you can still get to that no matter how bad stuff is on-premises. And I think that's a larger portion of the point. Certainly, Andy, you talked about building conditional access roles for even being able to sign in to a privileged account. And we guide to that as well. And you should do that. But I think that's also a point that can be missed. And really, that dovetails nicely into our fourth and final thing. And I'm going to let you go through it, Andy. But the idea there of using Azure AD cloud authentication entirely, moving away from that uh, federated authentication, one of the big points I make about that is, yes, there's security benefits to it, but again, it decouples your ability to access the cloud from your on-premises infrastructure being operational. So again, if your ADFS environment gets absolutely you know, floored, you can still get to the cloud because it seems silly. Like, I can't get to my cloud mailbox. Why? Because on-prem got hit. Like, what's the point of it being in the cloud if I have this dependency? So I'll let you kind of speak to the final thing with that. But I think both of those things tie, to, tie together that concept of that managing your devices in M365, um, I think, is partially to survive and, and just decouple yourself from any shenanigans on premises. Yeah, great point, Adam. And the final one is to use Azure AD cloud authentication to eliminate dependencies on your on premise credentials. Now, this whole time we have been talking about Azure AD, but obviously there are other identity providers out there. And the concepts here are the same. Like you should have administrators only for 
Okta be the cloud separated, not a synced account from Azure e- from Active Directory on prem to Okta as a company administrator over there or Ping or whoever, right? And so these concepts are the same. You know, obviously we say Azure AD, but it could be any identity provider. Um, and then, you know, when you're eliminating dependencies from on premise credentials, that means implementing passwordless authentication. So you want to use passwordless as much as possible Windows Hello, Fido, the Microsoft Authenticator, multi factor authentication. Now, there are some limitations and trade offs when it comes to the hybrid account password management. If you are using hybrid components of password uh, protection agents and password writeback agents, the on-premise infrastructure, if it is compromised, attackers can control machines where these agents reside. Now, that alone won't compromise your cloud infrastructure, but your cloud accounts won't protect these components from on-premise compromise. So keep that in mind if you're doing the hybrid password account management. Um, another thing that I, I don't know if this is common knowledge, but any on-premise account that's synced from Active Directory to Azure AD gets marked in Azure AD that their password never expires because the password expiration actually depends on the on-premise group policy that you have set. So in Azure AD, it's just automatically set to never expire if it's a synced account. If it's a cloud account, there is a password expiration policy within Azure AD that you can set for those cloud accounts. But any synced account is just always set to never expire and you can't change that. Now, if your on-premise Active Directory gets compromised and the synchronization is disabled, you can force through PowerShell a password uh, change for all of your synced users still. So um, that's another thing to keep in mind. Really good points there. And I like when you talked about other identity providers, because although we've really focused on get rid of federated authentication entirely, um, and we've talked about ADFS, technically, when you're using a third party cloud um, identity provider, like a ping or an Okta, you're still in a federated authentication model. Now, there's a, a higher degree of safety with those than ADFS, to be clear. So we're not picking on them. However, I think the risk still stands that if your admin accounts like would require you to sign into Okta then to get to Azure AD, now it's not the same thing as if on-prem gets compromised, but let's say Okta is down, Okta has issues. Now you can't get in and manage your Microsoft stuff. You've created an extra dependency. So that again goes back to the point of why we want these admin accounts mastered in Azure AD and and to be Azure AD native sign-in. That's because there's no other dependencies other than just Microsoft. If Microsoft is up, you can get in and manage your, your cloud. That's the whole point here. So I do understand there is nuance there and I think the risk level is different. So not picking on them, but just saying anytime you introduce additional dependencies, you create more risk that you may not be able to administer the service when you need to. You don't know potentially how catastrophic thing get, things could get. So that's a good point. And then, you know, talking about some of these, like if you're doing synchronized identities and again, on-premises gets compromised. So like you turn off Azure AD connect temporarily again, like a Maersk situation. Um, it's a really good call out that normally the Azure AD component of that synchronized identity doesn't have password expiration. And, and by the way, the reason why it's architected that way is for simplicity. The assumption is you're going to enforce that password change from the on-premises component of the identity. So like when I sign into my Windows workstation, when my password expires, I'm gonna be forced to change it on my workstation. So sometimes there may be scenarios where it's a synchronized identity theoretically, but they wouldn't have interaction with like windows or domain controllers to where that would ever be enforced. And so that would be another scenario when you'd want to use this PowerShell commandlet to force password expiration in the cloud instead to ensure that that process still 
occurs. And you would need to use something like password hash synchronization for that to work, by the way. Um, so some good callouts there. A really good point, Adam. I like that you talked about, like, if, say, you're using Okta, which is a federated identity to manage your identities within Office 365 and 365. And if that were to go down, now you can't access your Microsoft environment. One of the things in this document that I actually didn't put in the notes here, but it is highly recommended that you have a break glass account. A break glass account is literally that. It's something that is usually a global admin. It is there all the time, and it has probably a extre- an extremely long password, and it has no conditional access associated with it. It's something that you would normally exclude from all your conditional access policies. The big thing with break class accounts is you don't want to store that password in an on-premise password vaults. Like there are a bunch of password vaults that are still like, you know, like secret server or something like that, where it's like on-premise and you have to get to it from VPN or something like that. Don't store your break glass account in that. Um, You know, like you could put the password on a text file and then put it on USB and put it in a physical vault or something like that. You know, that'd be one way to do it or print it off and put it in a physical vault. Physical vaults are great too, by the way. If you're a security practitioner and you don't have a physical vault for your office, definitely something that I highly recommend. I've pushed for physical vaults at many of my corporate security jobs because you need to lock away laptops for you know investigation, forensics, um, legal uh, proceedings, um, yeah, so definitely have that, have a way of thinking about chain of custody. I'm on a little bit of a tangent, but just, you know, uh, it's related because break glass accounts, uh, you want a safe offline place to put that password. And, you know, similar to like, say, AWS, like the root account, um, you can have that root account on a USB um, FIDO authentication and put that into a physical safe somewhere. So um, all good ways to manage that Mm -hmm. the final thing some other considerations for like workloads and applications as you're decoupling your on-premise and your cloud environment you want to deprecate any on-premise federation and web access management infrastructure and configure those applications in azure ad that's pretty straightforward a lot of people are doing that any SaaS or line of business applications should support modern authentication protocols Anytime you're looking at new applications, the business review should include security because if that application requires some legacy LDAP authentication or something like that, that should be turned down unless it's overridden for some reason. But everything should be modern auth, SAML authentication, you know, SAML 2.0, um, using your whatever identity provider here, we talk about Azure AD, but you know it should have Octa integration, Ping integration, all the all the ones that uh, support that. Um, and then legacy authentication or le- legacy applications um, that are on prem, right? You need to be able to access those. Make sure that you choose a VPN vendor that has modern authentication. If you have to use VPN, you can use Azure AD App Proxy as well. If it's a web app. Another thing, and this can be used for admins too, if you need to like, say like get to a jump box to manage on-premise AD, right? Let, that's what I think I have an, an Azure AD join machine that is for my admin account, but then I need to manage on-prem and we're trying to save money because we don't want to have multiple machines. Well, you can use Azure Bastion. It's basically a jump box as a service. You can gate that behind conditional access and then have access to your on-premise infrastructure to manage on-premise identities, applications, whatever. Um, And there's also, of course, a a little-known thing called um, Azure AD Domain Services, which is basically infrastructure as a service. We can host an AD environment for you within Azure, and you can migrate on-premise applications to Azure within the 
hosted environment. And that hosted environment, then if you want to make sure that it's decoupled from, you know, on-premise, it shouldn't have network connectivity. Like whatever network it's on should not have a site-to-site VPN back to your corporate network. So um, this documentation that we're going to link in the show notes talks about a lot of things that we talked about. And there's even more things as far as security considerations, as far as documentation in what to monitor for security events and log management towards the end, like what events you should be looking for and all of this stuff. But highly recommend that you go through this. I mean, we went through on the high level here, but it is very, very detailed. It is something that I think every security defender, security architect should be looking at. Yeah, a couple of final thoughts here on on these kind of last items. Uh, Using Azure AD single sign-on or, again, identity provider of your choice for all the things is a great call out. I, I think I flagged, as we were talking earlier in the conversation, risks around the same being very similar to the Microsoft 365 risks of that lateral movement from on-premises to cloud. And that could be just as prevalent in other very critical services that you leverage. I named off like potentially Salesforce or Workday or Box or ServiceNow or whatever, Um, all things that you would want to protect as well. And so having those with a a cloud-based federated identity provider is a great call out as well as your uh, line of business apps, same benefit. One thing you talked about briefly, and I'll just add a little more color on, is Azure AD App Proxy. This is a feature that, honestly, I don't think could ever get enough love because it's really great. Uh, and, and a lot of people don't appreciate the benefit of it because in their mind, they think about it as this takes something behind the corporate firewall and it makes it accessible outside the corporate firewall. Um, and I can put conditional access on it. Well, that's cool. But really, the major benefit of this and the way... I like to think about it and encourage listeners to think about it is that it's, it's actually more of sign in like single sign on translation from legacy technologies, like integrated windows authentication with Kerberos to modern authentication. And it does that seamlessly. So you can have some old ancient application. We had this crusty app forever for years at Microsoft, um, that they finally modernized, which made me sad because it was such a great example, but it was called TAR and it was time and absence reporting. And it was literally like an interface from the IE five days and it had to be integrated Windows auth. In fact, I know it was, but once they put app proxy in front of it, then you could sign in from any modern authentication device and it would seamlessly work. So in the old days of TAR, when it was behind the firewall, like if I signed in on my Mac, I had to sign in like very old school, like domain backslash my username password to get into it. And then once it became uh, enabled with app proxy, I could sign in from my Mac and it was single sign on. It just recognized my Azure AD user identity and passed that through, translated it to my on-prem identity and boom, I was in. It was great. And so that's really a benefit is you don't have to change the code, refactor it, anything. It just works. So don't get hung up on app proxy as a thing that makes something accessible outside the network, although it does that and does it well. Think of it as I have this old app that uses legacy authentication methods and I want to modernize it. But the guy or gal who wrote the code has been retired for 15 years. Well, I've got a solution for you. And for m- almost everyone, it's probably already part of your Microsoft licensing because you only need Azure AD P1, which is like the E3 level to use it. So you probably already own this. So really, really great, helpful thing to modernize some of your legacy apps. And then one last note, Andy, you touched on Azure AD DS or Azure Active Directory Domain Services. And... um you, 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 you kind of said a couple of things here, so just want to clarify. Um, this is great for if you're transitioning your IaaS to Azure, but Azure AD DS itself is really a PaaS offering because you don't have to stand up your own like VMs and patch them and manage them. It's a managed service. And it's not a complete re-implementation of like ADDS on-premises. It's, it's more limited in scope. Um, which is really helpful for reducing risk as well. So you're not just standing up like another um, domain controller 
in Azure IaaS and, and syncing everything to it and just basically extending your existing attack surface. It's much more limited in what it can do. It's a completely managed service. It's always patched, always up to date. But if you have legacy services that need to have line of sight to Active Directory domain services, it's a great offering to do that. It sits right alongside all your, your IaaS stuff as that fully managed service and just basically does that for you. And it, with the correct network architecture, you can still achieve essentially decoupling from your on-premises infrastructure while still giving all that infrastructure access the line of sight they need to operate. So it gets a little in the weeds in a hurry with some of that stuff, but just know there's an offering there that doesn't involve you rolling more domain controllers and just putting them up in the cloud. It's actually a, a much more seamless solution that's just fully managed and, and you know about as secure as you can get for that scenario. So definitely something worth checking into if you're doing something else today or if you haven't yet begun migrating some of your infrastructure to the cloud. So really great call outs there. And I think for all of our listeners, like Andy said, we went over this super high level. I mean, we've, this show is 36 minutes recorded, so it'll be less than that edited. That's a lot of material in a short period of time. So be sure to check out this documentation. It's really, really good. It's laid out in a really thoughtful way and try to get some of this on your roadmap for actionable things you're going to look at and work on in, in the coming year, because I think this is, this is certainly, if this is some risk you can solve for, you're going to really, really be glad you did. Um, because some people have had really bad days because they unfortunately hadn't gotten to this work yet. And then as the bad guys got in, they were able to get far and wide in their environment instead of just kind of keeping them contained. Great call outs there, Adam. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for listening and watching as always. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you have any questions or topics you want us to talk about in the future. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.